Fanny and Alexander was the last theatrically released film by legendary director Ingmar Bergman. The film is a period drama that explores two children. Their lives change drastically after the death of their father. The film was originally intended to be a five episode miniseries, but was later cut down to be a theatrically released film, clocking in at three hours. The extended cut remains one of the longest theatrically released films in history. Hey guys, and welcome to Garage Movie Reviews, where we explore a random movie that's on my mind. Misleading name, this isn't Garage Movie Reviews, I'm back at home in Canada, therefore we are not in the garage today. Also, if I sound shitty, it's because I'm under the weather, hence why there hasn't been videos on this channel for like a week. I apologize. It's not the vid, okay guys? It's not the vid, it's not COVID. Disclaimer, and I'm not allowed to say COVID on YouTube either, so I shouldn't be saying, I should censor it. Beep, bop, boop, it's not the beep, bop, boop. All right, that's me attempting censorship. So yeah, I've never seen the Ingmar Bergman movie, Fanny and Alexander, mostly because it has a very daunting runtime. The runtime of the theatrical release is like three hours, 10 minutes. And whenever I say a three hour, 10 minute movie, I'm like, ugh. But I love Ingmar Bergman, so I figured now is as good a time as any. It's the Christmas time. This is considered a Christmas movie by most. Not all, but most. We're gonna get into that in the next episode. But yeah, this movie, you have two kids, and they live with their father. Their father runs a theater, and they're putting on this show for the nativity. And it's a very cozy household environment. All of a sudden, the dad passes away unexpectedly from a stroke, leaving the two kids to their mother. And the mother marries the local bishop. The bishop, however, is very abusive. I kind of separate this movie into two parts. You have the first half of this movie, that is this big, festive Christmas celebration. And then you have the second half of the movie, which is a very dark and depressing uh, tone both separated by the death of the father. The second half kind of focuses on the bishop. And the reason why it's separated into halves is because that first half is very colorful and festive and the tone is very happy. Newcomer. <laughs> <laughs> And then the second half is very dour and depressing and gloomy. And you can just see that by the houses. The first mansion the kids live in is very warm colors, lots of reds and yellows. And then the bishop's mansion is very 15th century bleh, <laughs> for lack of a better term. And that works because you're watching this movie and this movie is told through a child's perspective. And that contrast is going to be much more evident when you see it through the eyes of a child. This is a more personal film by Ingmar Bergman. A lot of Ingmar Bergman's films are very big and philosophical and heady. Movies like The Seventh Seal and movies like Persona. They have a very Ingmar Bergman feel, but this isn't it. This feels a lot more calm and relaxed and introspective for Ingmar Bergman. It's a lot calmer, but it still has the slight isms you would expect in Igmar Bergman. The movie, at its core, really takes place in reality, unlike a movie like The Seventh Seal. But slowly as the movie progresses, you're introduced to more supernatural things. The movie opens, and you have Alexander, who's uh, looking at this statue, and the statue seems to be coming to life. But that happens early on in the film. And then as the film progresses, you kind of forget that scene. And once the father passes away, then you start getting these little supernatural tones thrown into the film. The film definitely hits peak strangeness 
when the children try to escape the bishop's mansion, their uncle tries to sneak them into a crate, and the whole way that scene is edited feels a little odd and strange. It kind of doesn't really make any sense. One second they're in the crate, the other second they're out of the crate. So what does it all mean? Unlike a movie like Persona or The Seventh Seal, this isn't a movie that's talked much on the internet, so there's not as many interpretations of it. My interpretation of this is that this is kind of Igmar Bergman's way of exploring his childhood and how did his fascination with the supernatural and themes like the struggle of faith, how did those come to be looking back through his childhood? A lot of Bergman's films se seem to deal with the topic of struggling with your faith and what happens after death. And here Bergman is kind of thinking back, what events in my childhood could have let me to be fascinated with that theme? And a lot of that is through the character of the abusive bishop. Bergman related it to his own stepfather, who was a Lutheran pastor, who was apparently pretty abusive towards him. And that abuse led Bergman to kind of question the nature of his faith. At certain points in this film as well, characters repeat that ghosts don't exist and Alex should just grow up and stop fearing ghosts because he's outgrown that phase. But Bergman seems to suggest that kids are able to see a different plane than adults, which is why Alexander sees the statue move at the beginning of the film. Also, when he goes to his uncle's house, his uncle has a lot of puppets, and the puppets move, and it's all kind of strange through Alex's perspective. Again, this all kind of makes sense because you're watching the film through the perspective of the children. So for those reasons, I kind of think this is basically Bergman reflecting on his childhood and thinking of his fascination with the supernatural and with uh, religion. And for that, I really think this movie is interesting. Now, is it worth the three hour runtime? In my opinion, it is. But to many, a three hour runtime, three hour plus, by the way, it's like three hour 15 almost. That's very overwhelming to some audience members. So you really have to block off a chunk of your schedule when you have to watch this movie. But I enjoy it. It's definitely a good time. It's not my favorite Bergman movie. I think Brasana is his best one personally. And I do like it when Bergman goes a little more crazy and this isn't it. But as far as like just like a window into the mind of Bergman, I think this is the movie that does it. Bergman even goes to darker places of his mind. There's a part here where Alexander sees his cousin, I think, and the cousin is played by some male, is a male, but is played by a female, like this weird androgynous character. I shouldn't say weird for an androgynous person. It's 2021. Being androgynous is normal, ladies and gentlemen. But yeah, this weird, creepy character comes in and Alexander, uh, in all anger and rage, wishes that the bishop catches flames and burns alive, which actually happens. And to think that that character was based off someone that Bergman actually knew, and he actually put that in the movie, it actually shows how much resentment and anger Bergman had towards this person who deeply affected his life. So yeah, what can I say about this movie? I, I think it's a good time. It's a good movie to watch in the Christmas time, especially for that first half, and it really does have a Charles Dickens vibe to it. That Christmassy vibe, you have uh, apparitions from the father, who's kind of like a ghost in this movie, kind of reminded me of A Christmas Carol, and then you have the story of an orphan, and it kind of rem it all kind of reminded me of Charles Dickens, but with a nice Ingmar Bergman touch to it. So guys, if you haven't seen Fanny and Alexander, I suggest you guys watch it, you guys will enjoy it. In the Garage Movie Thoughts component of this video, 
we're going to explore what I call borderline Christmas movies, which are Christmas movies that aren't really Christmas movies. And I'll be determining once and for all, are they actually Christmas movies or are they not Christmas movies? So stay tuned, guys, and take care of yourselves. I'll see you guys around. Do you have